take it off in a second. No. I did. He was, uh, he was kind of making it. morning to the celebration of life with John Wilmar Jensen. Well, Jake and I will be conducting the Masonic funeral service. Basically, it's not a religion, and Jake and I are certainly not clergy. We're just members of Modesto Lodge number 206. Wilmar was a member of our lodge. Wilmar was our brother. We'll begin. Brother and friend, it has been the custom among the fraternity of free and accepted Masons from time immemorial, at the request of a departed brother or his family, to assemble in the character of Masons and with the solemn formalities of the crowd, to offer up to his memory before the world the last tribute of our affection. Our brother has reached the end of his earthly toil. The brittle thread which bound him to earth has been severed, and the liberated spirit has winged its flight to the unknown world. The silver cord is loose, the golden bowl is broken, the picture is broken at the fountain, and the wheel is broken at the system. The dust has returned to the earth as it was, and the 
spirit has returned to God. Okay. The Sacred Role. Worshipful Brother John Wilmark Jensen Esquire, past master of Modesto Lodge No. 206. Initiated on June 10, 1953, passed to the degree of Fellowcraft on November 11, 1953, and raised to the degree of Master Mason on February 24, 1954, all in Modesto Lodge No. 675, now Modesto Lodge No. 206. Entered into rest January 6, 2024, at the age of 96 years and 11 days. Worshipful Brother Jensen began his advancement to the Lodge in 1957 and achieved the Master's Chair in 1964. After he was Master of the Lodge, he worked to obtain the approval of the City of Modesto for the construction of the building in which we are today. Worshipful Brother Jensen was a Mason for 70 years and received the Golden Veterans Award in 2004. He was given the Hiram Award in 2017 for his work in Freemasonry and the community. The Hiram Award is the highest award a lodge can give a member. He was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason and a member of Army Shrine and the Modesto Shrine Club. He was an example to all Masons and a truly extraordinary man. Almighty Father, into thy hands we commend the soul of our beloved brother. The great creator having in his infinite mercy, excuse me, great creator having in his infinite wisdom removed our brother from the cares and troubles of this earthly life, thus severing another link in the paternal chain by which we are bound together. Let us who survive it be yet more strongly cemented by the ties of brotherly love, that during the brief space allotted to us here, we may wisely and usefully employ our time. And in the mutual exchange of kind and friendly acts, promote the welfare and happiness of each other. While we pay this eternal tribute to his memory, let us not forget, my brethren, that we too are mortal and that our spirits, too, must return to the God who staked them into existence. Man who is born of a woman is of two days, and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower, and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow, and continueth not. The Almighty Fiat has gone forth, thus thou art, and unto thus shalt thou return, and that we are all subject to that decree. The daily observation of our lives furnishes evidence not to be forgotten. Saying then, my brethren, that life is so uncertain and that all material pursuits are vain, let us no longer postpone that all important concern in preparing for eternity, but let us embrace the present moment when time and opportunity are offered to provide for that great change when all the pomp and pleasures of this leading world will follow on the senses, and the recollection of a virtuous and well-spent life will yield the only comfort and consolation. Thus, we will not be unprepared to enter into the presence of the one all-wise and powerful judge, to whom the secrets of all hearts are known. And on that great day of reckoning, we will be ready to give a good account of our stewardship while here on earth. With becoming reverence, let us supplicate the divine grace, whose goodness and power know no bounds, that on the arrival of the momentous hour, our faith may remove the clouds of doubt, draw aside the sable curtains to the hidden world beyond, and to hope, sustain, and cheer the departing.
thy hands may be sanctified in its results on the hearts of those who weep to mourn. May the present instance of mortality draw our attention to it. The only refuge in time of need enable us to look with eyes of faith toward that realm whose skies are never darkened by sorrow, and after our departure hence in peace and in thy favor, may we be received into the everlasting kingdom to enjoy the just reward of a virtuous and well-spent life. Amen. So far <laughs> Our brother has been raised in that blissful lodge which no time can close, but which will remain open during the boundless ages of eternity. In that heavenly sanctuary, the mystic light, unmingled with darkness, will reign unbroken and protection. There, under the protection of the all-seeing eye, amid the smiles of immutable love, in that house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, there, my brethren, may Almighty God in His infinite mercy grant that we may meet again, depart no more. The lambskin apron is an emblem of innocence and the badge of a mason. More ancient than the golden fleece or the Roman eagle, more honorable than the star or garter or any distinction that can be conferred by king prince, potentate, or any other person. By it, we are continually reminded of that purity, life, and conduct, so essentially necessary to gain admission into the celestial lodge above, where the supreme grand master of the universe forever resides. This evergreen, which once marked a temporary resting place of one illustrious and Masonic history, is an emblem of our enduring faith in the immortality of the soul. By it, we are reminded that we have an imperishable part within us, which will survive all earthly existence, and which will never, never die. Through the loving goodness of our Supreme Grand Master, we may confidently hope that life is evergreen, our souls may hereafter flourish in eternal spring. We shall never cherish in our hearts the memory of our departed brother. And commending his spirit to Almighty God, we trustingly leave him in the hands of that beneficent spirit who has done all things well, who is glorious in his holiness, wondrous in his power, and boundless in his goodness. And it should always be our endeavor so to live that we too may be found worthy to inherit the kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world. We extend to the great relatives and friends of our departed brother our sincere sympathy in this hour of sorrow. And we pray that he who tempers the wind to the shore and land will give them his divine comfort and consolation. And that they may come to realize that the spirit of our brother is happy in his father's house, where God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and where there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Heavenly Father, as we come to perform the final act of pardon from our brother, grant that we may be, have inspired vision to enable us with the look with faith beyond the veil, and that our hearts may know the continual presence of the soul now set free from the limitations of mortality. We pray thee to give us strength to bear our daily burdens until we too shall enter into the celestial lodge above, to dwell with those who have served with us here, until time shall be no more. Amen. So holy be. Soft 
and safe to thee, my brother, be thy resting place. Bright and glorious be thy resting company. Fragrant be the acacia strip which there shall flourish. May the earliest buds of spring unfold their beauties over thy resting place, and there may the sweetness of summer's last rose linger longest. Though the winds of autumn may destroy the loveliness of their existence, yet the destruction is not final, and in the springtime they shall surely bloom again. So, in the bright morning of the resurrection, thy spirit will spring into newness of life and expand an immortal beauty in realms beyond the stars. Until then, dear brother, until then,
he said, Alan, that is one thing that no one can ever take away from you. You can lose your ranch, you can lose your other possessions, but you can never have that education taken away. It wasn't easy, but Wilmar helped save our family farm. Where today my granddaughters are the sixth generation to live on that ranch. You can see why I'm so grateful. <coughs> Wilmar, even one evening, came out to our house and represented my mom to hash out the details with some folks that weren't making her life too present, pleasant at the time. I'll never forget that being in our living room. My admiration for Wilmar only grew. <clears throat> I'd like to tell kind of a funny story next about Wilmar. A few years later, I was going to marry the love of my life. And my Aunt Betty Bell Smith, who some of you I'm sure remember in here, and her husband Gene decided that my wife didn't wasn't the only one to have a shower, that Betty Bell thought I ought to have a show. <laughs> and we had it in their home there on Sycamore Avenue, and Wilmar was an invited guest. My wife reminded me uh, the other day that the gift he gave us was a trash can. <laughs> it's still in my bathroom today. <laughs> Certainly a testament to his practical nature. <laughs> To sum things up, Wilmar was a role model for me. One other thing I'll mention that Wilmar was a master of Lodge 675 when I got my third degree as Master of Mason. That meant a lot to me. I watched how much Wilmar loved his wife, Judy. They were they were always together at functions, and he was so proud of his children, Mark and Kristen and Kirk and Karen, and he encouraged them in their own way to pursue their interests and their dreams. I guess I knew Kirk the best, because he and I were both Aggies, and I met Kirk when he took a welding class for me at MJC. And he told me later that he used that skill to build a lot of his own equipment in his first hauler and processor. He, like all of his brothers and sisters, were very sharp. And Kirk told me, Kirk told me later that he did use a lot of his skills. I was proud of him and Wilmar was equally proud of all of his kids for the fine people they had become. In the last few years, Wilmar was so excited to see the things his grandchildren were accomplishing. He loved you all so much. Besides love, Wilmar exhibited a high degree of truth and principle. He was an honest, detailed, and extremely thorough man. He told me once to never tell a lie. Because he said, Alan, that means you'll have to tell another one, or a second one. Good advice. A final thing Wilmar told me when I was going through a challenge one time, he said, Alan, life is like a cut on your hand. It can hurt, it can bleed a little, it can take some time to heal. But the scar tissue that is left on that wound is tougher than the original skin. You will come out stronger. You just have to persevere. So in closing, Wilmar, job well done, my friend. I love you. Thank you. And as Roy Rogers said, happy trails to you. Until we meet again. Thank you, Alan. Uh, that was that was excellent. Uh, 
ask Steve Palios to come to the uh, front. Uh, Steve's a Modesto attorney has worked with that for many years. Good morning. I first became acquainted with Wilmar through the law. Through that contact, over time, I came to know Wilmar the man. Initially, our interaction was the type you would expect from a state planning and business attorney. Eventually, our dealings became more substantive. Much of our contact was me performing court appraisals of property held in the state administration Wilmar was handling. This included Wilmar correcting my mistakes and valuations. <laughs> Through his mentorship, I eventually improved over time. <laughs> These visits also enabled me to learn more about Wilmar. I love those meetings. If a young lawyer wanted to become a quality lawyer, the best thing he or she could do would be to emulate Wilmar. Wilmar was well-educated and brilliant. That is just a natural advantage he had over the others, and he took care to stay that way. He set very high standards for himself, and he maintained those standards throughout his long career. He was always learning. It is hard enough for lawyers to stay up to date with all the changes in the law, but Wilmar did better than that. He studied the law carefully and could project the trends and future changes in the law, the economy, business, politics, and life itself. Wilmar helped his clients plan for the present. But more importantly, he helped them plan for the future. Wilmar's hard work is legendary. He started work early in the day and stayed late. He worked more than five hours, but five days a week. I personally don't know of an attorney who worked effectively for such a long career. What struck me most about Wilmar was how he spent his leisure time. He worked. <laughs> On some Monday years ago, when I called Wilmar to discuss one of my appraisals, I led off with some pleasantries. I asked if he had enjoyed the weekend and if perhaps he was a golfer. Wilmer told me he golfed some, but was not very good. He then told me that people should be suspicious of lawyers who were good golfers. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. 
That was that was a fine tribute to Dad. Uh, I would like to ask Bill Mattis to come forward. Bill's known Dad for a year or two. <laughs> through, through a couple of careers of Bill. So.
Forearm is honored by more organizations than anyone I know, and his contributions to each were phenomenal. Whether it was Newman 4-H and FFA, Modesto Area Community Hospice, Gallo Art Center, he gave with all his heart. And his many awards proved it. His visits to his family farm between Newman and Gustine, which he did more and more as he got older, included hosting many of us West, Side, West, Side, West Siders and his family on various occasions. Some of us Westsiders experienced Wilmar's generosity and love for his community in our own special way. Some Westside leaders who lived and worked in Newman and Bestine felt Wilmar's touch locally in so many ways, just like many of you. Without, without the knowledge of his remarkable achievements throughout this area, he was a giant to so many of us who knew him for decades. He was living proof of just how fine a person can be. My condolences to Judy, his very kind and loving children, family, who continue to serve and flourish wherever they go and in everything they do. Thank you.
moment. I didn't rely on him for his advice and guidance and for teaching me how to live my life. He was always so steady and solid. You could count on it. Being in this Masonic temple brings back some memories for me of my dad because when I was in high school, um, I became worthy advisor of the Rainbow Girls and my dad came to almost all the functions and meetings with me to support me. And I remember one time when I was 16 years old, I was driving here. Um, actually, I think in my mom's new car. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I was turning left on the Rose Avenue right, right around here and right down the street. And I got in a car accident. And nobody had cell phones then. I guess I'm pretty old too, Mark. And, um, so a lady at the neighboring house let me use the phone and I called my dad at the office and he said he needed to come. And my dad always said that he sweat clean through his suit that day <laughs> when he was coming to get me. And I was okay, but we were both pretty shaken. And I had, we had to go straight from the car accident to this hall. And I can't remember if it was an installation service or an initiation service, but I had to preside over it for about two hours of ritual work that you memorized, as you saw in the service today. Um, my dad came with me, he was sitting right over there, and as soon as it ended, we just left, went home, exhausted, and went to bed. And it was that day that I realized that I could really get through almost anything as long as I had the support of my dad. Sorry, <laughs> snorting here. <laughs> Dad is pretty much the most hardworking person that I've ever known. He was very successful in his life, but he was always humble about it. He'd always say, well, yeah, you know, I'm smart enough, but what's really got me ahead was that I can usually work pretty much harder than anybody else. And he also always said that he was very careful to save his money. And I know my mom was a big part of that. He was careful to save, too. I, she was always clipping coupons out of the newspaper and driving all over town to get the best deals on groceries <laughs> and cooking at home. And I have one of her recipes at home for a casserole that says, serve six for 88 cents. <laughs> And he never 
were about to soar at us no matter what we did. We had a lot of adventures. Even when one time Kirk wrapped the back of the station wagon around a tree. <laughs> and I backed out of the barn so fast that everybody had to jump out of the way not to get killed by it. And, and Dad was kind of a believer in teaching kids to drive early. And I know all the grandkids enjoyed driving the mule around the ranch. He thought they could learn to drive at eight. <laughs> and they would drive around and it was big fun. All the way from Matthew all the way down to Elizabeth and Christina learned. And when we grew up, he really, one of the things he enjoyed most was continuing to work with his kids. And nothing made my dad happier than that my brother was his partner in the law practice. My brother Mark and my brother Kirk managed the farming business with him. That really made him happy. Okay, another tradition we had was going camping together. So when we were kids, we'd pack up the old blue station wagon with Grandpa Bill and a coffee can full of Grandma's oatmeal cookies, and we'd head out to the mountains. We really loved it because Dad wouldn't make us take a bath for a four whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would fish and, and ride horses and play cards and swim. And when the grandkids came along, we revived the tradition, starting with Matthew and then adding each of the other kids when they turned five years old. And I think my younger daughter, Christina, sneaked in at four, but it was getting late then. Um, and then we really enjoyed it. It was a good time for us. It was a good time for the four of us brothers and sisters to spend time just with each other and with our dad and with our children. And dad was always the first one up in the mornings, and he'd have the old camping coffee pot full of hot water for hot chocolate and coffee for us. And then he'd cook up a big breakfast for everybody. And he always had lots of bacon, which was a big hit with the kids. <laughs> Dad never played favorites. He always said that he loved each of us kids equally. And he never pitted us one against the other. He always said, each of you kids is an absolute original. <laughs> and he appreciated us for our differences and for the people that we are. And he always instilled in us the importance of sticking together as brothers and sisters no matter what. He said, your friends can come and go, but you will always have your brothers and sisters. Dad always made it a point to tell us that he loved us. He loved my mom, and I always picture him night after night, leaning over her sitting in the family room, giving her a kiss on the cheek and saying, good night, Judy, love you. And he loved each of us and all of the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and Mary Ann and Stacy and Nick and Amber too. And he made sure we knew it. He'd always say, hi beautiful, or, hi honey bunch. And sometimes he got a little strange look from some of his clients if they didn't know that it was his granddaughter or his granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> but one time pretty recently, honestly, I think it was maybe a year ago, he was at the library across from his office there downtown, and he ran into my sister Christine, and she had a whole class full of her little first graders in to go for a field trip to the library. And she heard all the little kids, a little ripple go through the little kids, and they said, that's Mrs. Jensen's dad. He called her Honey Bunch. <laughs>
going here, but I want to end by just letting you know that we're going to all miss him just terribly. But we feel grateful that we had so many really good years with him. Our dad was truly one of a kind, and he continued to inspire us with his strength, his kindness, his wisdom, and his unfailing good humor right up until the end. Longevity uh, 
Uh, a key to longevity is developing good habits, such as a proper diet, proper sleep, exercise. Uh, my dad is the master of all of these things. He was the master of routine. He stayed on schedule all of his life uh, with all of these items and many more. Uh, you could set your watch by what time he was going to show up to the office, what time he was going to leave, what time he would have lunch, dinner, breakfast, what he would eat during these times. He, he, he was a habit, he was a man of habit, and, uh, uh, and it helped him. Uh, he did enjoy a cocktail or two. Um, he, had a, he had a strong routine of having, he and my mom would have one drink after work each day, faithfully, he never missed a day. And you could sort of gauge how his day had gone by how big the glass was. <laughs> um, but he was a man of moderation. And uh, I, I can honestly state in all these years I've never, I've seen him, I've seen him a little bit tipsy a time or two, but never drunk, never. Um, he, was, he, uh, he was the original, uh, you know, exerciser in an organic fashion, like he never had a gym membership, and he would never do an organized exercise activity. However, he exercised all the time by working outside at his ranch and uh, doing physical tasks. As long as he could find a, a productive way to do it, he would do it. Um, but he wasn't a guy that would just go to the gym and ride a treadmill. That would be a waste of time. And, you know, <laughs> waste of time. <laughs> He was a multitasker. Um, as we were kids, we learned this very early. He wouldn't just sit down and watch uh, a football game on TV unless he was doing something else while doing it. Working on his bills, cracking walnuts with a hammer, polishing his shoes, um, anything like that, he would, he would do it. Um, he, he, learned, he learned not to waste time from my grandmother. Um, she felt that there was a lot of wasted time in the educational system, for example. This was back in the 30s. But, so she advanced him at least a couple of grades. I, I'm not sure if it was two or three grades, but then he got out of high school. Um, and he kept it up. Um, as I put in the obituary, I mean, he graduated from high school at a very young age, flew through college, went to military service, went back to college, went to law school, and got back here in time to start his law firm when he was 24. So, he, he, and, and he continued it. He, as many of you know, he, he wasn't one to waste his time or yours. He was an expert at starting and ending his law, his legal meetings on time. Never rushing anybody, but when time was up, the meeting was over and that was that. Um, he enjoyed working, as others have said. He, he loved working, he loved being productive. He said that work was a cure for many of life's problems. Any, anytime you've got a problem, <coughs> go back to work. <laughs> he, often, he often said how much he enjoyed manual labor. He, he loved working at the ranch. He loved doing basic jobs. If he called someone else a hard worker, that was probably one of the highest marks of respect. He could give someone. <clears throat> he, he loved our practice. Um, he, he was a good lawyer, a great lawyer, and uh, he loved all of the clients and the many generations of families in the dust of Newman, Oakdale, and other areas that we represented and he represented. He considered all of you to be his friends and almost a part of the family. He was as proud of your successes as he was of his own successes or those of the family. Uh, and he shared people's sorrow when something bad happened. For years he was uh, religious about cutting articles out of various publications uh, about his clients, their children, their families, and the successes they had. And when asked, he was just going to cut that out and put it in the file. You have all of your files and they have your <laughs> You also never threw away any files. You need them, you got them. Um, and he, he was also very good about writing to people to commend them on their various achievements. My dad was 
great memory and he had an innate common sense practicality. He was a great test taker, a uh, little known skill that he had. But when uh, the California Bar, State Bar developed a certified specialist program in estate planning and trust and probate, Dad was already well into his 60s and uh, he decided to sit for the test, which he did with very little preparation and passed it no problem. So he was a specialist for, for 30 years. He just very recently relinquished that. Um, he, he was a great resource for me at the office. Um, well, I, I could have saved a lot on legal publications but just by asking him all these questions. <laughs> he had an intuitive grasp of the law and, and how it applied to a given situation. Dad was competitive. Um, he often measured his own performance against that of others. Uh, even, even at work, even at the office, he was competitive with me. <laughs> um, you know, and, and one job that he kept until very, very recently was tallying up how we had done over the year and keeping track of it. And, uh, he, he said that he wanted to make sure that he was pulling his share of the load or holding up his end. And uh, um, he, he was a great partner in that respect. We had, we had, a, we had a fantastic partnership for all these years. But, but although he was competitive, he was never envious of someone else's success or achievements. He was, he was always uh, complimentary of other people who had achieved things, uh, and especially his friends. He was a child of the Great Depression. Some of you here are old enough to have been through that, that time. So his formative years were during very lean times. And uh, he learned the value of hard work and frugality at a young age, uh, which led him to ne never wasting anything, time or any other resource. Even, even late into his life, recently, we would spot Christmas gifts or other presents that we've given him in his closet, in their original wrappers, <laughs> unused. And, and when we inquired, uh, he always said, and he invariably said he was saving that for later. <laughs> so he, he, he was very careful with his resources. He felt very blessed uh, by his successes and he was very generous to us and to others. Uh, he, he uh, was eager to share his success with people. Um, one of his things, he and my mom took us on many vacations, and my dad was well known for stating that vacation is no time to save money. <laughs> and uh, he, was, he, he, he didn't have any problem at all with spending money flying on first class or staying in a good hotel or getting a good suite. Um, he enjoyed that very much, but it didn't really change how he lived his regular life. <laughs> He, he, he loved his life, really. Uh, he was generally an upbeat person, as most of you know, positive, optimistic. Um, he saw things, uh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't bitter or resentful. Uh, he didn't hold grudges. He was generally inclined to forgive, though so not necessarily forget. He, he, remembered, he remembered things, but he, he forgave people. Um, he was, a, he was a glass half full type type person. And, uh, and, but it, at the same time, he wasn't uh, looking at the world through rose colored glasses either. I mean, he was a realist. He, he saw things how they were and not how he wanted them to be. However, that didn't stop him from trying to change things for the better. That was what he was working on with the, all of his political activities for so many years. Um, he, he supported so many candidates who, who he believed in and who he knew um, and hoped that change, things would get better. Uh, he was uh, uh, often told me that if you expect people to do the right thing, a lot of times they will. And that's how he conducted his law practice. Uh, he was always surprised if somebody on the other side of an issue did something unreasonable or something unfair, uh, but most of the time, the other side behaved well uh, because he expected it of them, and I think they wanted to live up to that. Um, he always made the best of things and tried to make lemonade out of them. From my grandmother, he also learned a passion.
passion for reading and education. He, he was a lifelong learner. He read voraciously. I mean, in, up to the end, uh, he read all kinds of things. Histories, biographies, uh, the great books, all kinds of novels. Loved cowboy novels. Loved Louis L'Amour. He, he learned a lot of wisdom from Louis L'Amour. <laughs> Maybe I should read up on my movie before. Um, he, even the last couple of years, he was working on, working his way through the 11 volume set of the history of Western civilization written by Will Durant. Uh, and he, I don't think he quite made it. He, I think it was in like volume 7 or something, but, but uh, so he didn't quite get it. But he was still learning. Even when he was like in his 60s, he, uh, developed an interest in classical and symphonic music and really threw himself into it. I mean, he bought all kinds of CDs, uh, tapes. He would listen to them on the way to work, on the way to Newman, on the way to Oakdale, whatever, multitasking again. Um, and uh, he joined the board of the Mesa Symphony Orchestra and he really got into it. Um, he learned a lot from his travels, uh, always was interested to see things and see new things. When he was in his 80s, he said he had never been to Rome and wanted to go to Rome. So we went. Um, he, was, he was a builder. He loved building the law business. He loved building the farming business. And, uh, he was still taking new clients until earlier this year. Um, and I, I asked him, you know, Dad, you're taking new clients. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him, you know, why are you doing this? And, and he said, well, I, you know, I'm in the habit of building my practice. <laughs> he sees no reason to change his habit. <laughs> what was I going to say? Um, he, he, he's still building his farming operation. Uh, he and my brother planted new orchards as recently as 2022. Uh, he, he, he's a natural farmer. Like Andrew said, I mean, he was a farmer at heart. I mean, he loved the land. He loved making things grow. Uh, now, as most of you probably know, he wasn't a big believer in man-made climate change. But he did do his part, more than most, on, on climate change by planting hundreds of acres of trees, which is a big carbon capture program that he offered. Uh, he didn't neglect the home front on the building either. He was fond of stating that he had remodeled every house he owned, some of them more than once. <laughs> he was a principled man. There was a number of values uh, that he held sacred. Primarily being honest and ethical in everything. I learned from working with him that when we were confronted with a problem, this approach to the problem, to the solution to the problem, was to try to find out what was the right thing to do. Not the easy thing. But, uh, he loved my mom, and he loved our family, and he loved this country. Um, he always had time for us. He was loyal to his friends. He was loyal to the community. He believed in the principles that the nation was founded on, in, including freedom, liberty, private property, and the sanctity of contract. That last one being very important. He was, he was a man of his word. Truly old school. His word was his bond, and everyone knew that. He was fiercely independent. He uh, always wanted to be his own boss. He didn't want to tell you how to live your life, but he also didn't want you telling him how to live his life. He was a man of faith, though not an adherent of organized religion. He tried to live his values every day. He was conservative in all things. He was inflexible on his main principles, but he was always open to new ideas and new points of view. All of these characteristics, traits, and habits, and routines are what made up the fabric of his life. And I'm convinced that all of these things played a role in his longevity, particularly the fact that he stayed involved, he stayed working, he, he was out in the community. Uh, we're still going to the 
same thing within the last few months. Uh, all of that led to a long life. We're going to miss it. We're going to miss his presence. Um, he wasn't afraid to die. I'm, I'm confident that he's in heaven. Well, well, losing him, losing Lomar Jensen is sad for all of us, each in our own way. We really can and should celebrate his long, happy, and productive life. And uh, I'm not going to actually throw away my longevity books, but I'm going to put them aside and just try to follow his example. Um, I do want to thank you all again for being here, and uh, I hope you can stay and join us in the dining hall for reception. I want to thank uh, a few people. Uh, I want to thank uh, our, the caregivers that have helped my mom and dad for the last few years. Some of them were here today. Uh, specifically, Maricela, Heather, and Zarmina. Uh, I would also like to thank our, uh, all of our employees and staff at the office and at the ranch, and all of those people who help us do everything we do every day. Um, I'd like to thank the Omega Nu ladies who made all of the desserts we're going to have later. Uh, I'd like to thank my sister-in-law, Bernie Medeiros, who's our caterer today. Uh, New Splash. Harry Brobus is here today, so even though it's early, <laughs> drinking will commence shortly. I'd like to thank Harry, and uh, from the looks of it, he came loaded. <laughs> I don't know if that's a comment on the hard drinking nature of my dad's friend, but um, it, it's available. <laughs> start. I'd like to thank Darren Morris, who provided us our, our music today. Um, I'd like to thank the family for all you've done. So, at this point, I'd like to conclude and just thank you all again for being here and for being friends with Dad. Um, one last thing, I, I've told people this, but uh, I've been practicing for all of these years and I like my clients and they like me and I'm sure of that and I'm very comfortable. But my dad's clients, they love him. <laughs> I'm finding this out all the time now. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I think I'm going to be a little bit judged by some of those clients who are his clients that are now becoming my clients, and they're going to be wondering if I can live up to what he could do, which I doubt I can. But uh, dad, dad had a way of drawing us into his life and letting us know that he truly cares about us and all of you. And uh, so, anyway, it's sad to say goodbye to him, but I don't know. I told the family yesterday, we're crying for us, not him. He did great. Everything's great for him. He worked it out. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and, and please stay for the
Yeah. <laughs> 